But we, we realize that there's a lot of information uh, in this session. So we, uh, Dr. Peter Kalto kindly uh, agreed uh, to put, uh, to summarize some of the key points uh, to, and use them as a starting point for a conversation that we still have half hour, and I'm sure that you have many questions and a conversation to discuss the implementation of the Okay, um, I'm going to be very quick. I just have a couple, three slides to share with you. And my intention here is not to try to summarize the richness of everything you've heard, but really to, in, to invite you, all of you, to participate in a half hour or so of discussion about where we go, what we learn, what do you think about all of this. So we really want this, this whole session to be open and interactive, and I'm going to try to start you out along that. There are a few generalizations, I think, um, there are probably many generalizations, but there are a few that I want to call attention to and kind of flag for you as potential topics that we could discuss further. And these are general research process issues that we see in these three examples of intervention, um, of interventions that attempt to uh, to integrate across multiple platforms. So, number one, and I think all three of the presenters have, have described this, have stressed it, is stakeholder mobilization. It's absolutely essential to create opportunities for interaction with delivery system professionals, including building in periodic interactions with agency staff dealing constructively with concerns and conflicts, and sustaining support from high-level leadership. I think it's probably fair to say that without this component being in place, efforts to integrate uh, across uh, platforms or across agencies or across units within agencies are not likely to be very successful. The second piece here, that emerges from an examination of, okay, what really goes on when people try to plan uh, interventions across uh, integrated interventions, is that compared to other types of community-based research, integration research studies often experience delays outside of investigators' control. Now that doesn't mean that all of us haven't experienced that in almost every project we've ever undertaken. But I think that there's greater vulnerability in integration projects than there is um, in sort of the, the normal course of community interventions. And what's the take-home lesson on that? Greater flexibility is required. And the real take-home lesson is and that needs to be negotiated. And we've heard multiple times in the Congress about the role of donors. A couple of people on the panel here have mentioned that. And one of the pieces from, from our perspective is that flexibility to meet delays and the consequences of delays is really pretty essential. Um, these are pretty standard, we can say yes, that's true for everything we do, but I think we could make the case that it's particularly important for us. So, I mean, two points in here are two, two more. Uh, financial resources. Compared to lab studies and other types of community-based research, funding organizations with, who do not have prior experience with integration studies are often reluctant to allocate sufficient funds to examine complex environments. When you start down the integration path, you are jumping into complex environments. We all want to jump into complex um, environments, even without integration, but this is particularly something to be very much aware of when we move into this space. There's a, a, a second piece of that, which is that it is very difficult 
to accurately estimate costs at the beginning of a project. When you're doing an integrated project, some very unpleasant surprises show up along the way. And those surprises and difficulties have economic have financial consequences for work. And contingency funding is essential. And that means that when you can negotiate the original budget for doing this work, you better negotiate some contingency funding for what's likely to come down the pike. And then a fourth general uh, Generalization of the field concerns personnel. For some components of, uh, of this type of work, especially if you're going to work in the community, especially if you're going to try to get people's perspective, the perspective of the people, in principle, you're trying to work to help, uh, you have to have high quality in the field team. I just can't stress that enough because many field workers have simply not been trained to appreciate the importance of sen sensitivity, to understand how to pick up on clues and cues and follow them up, to avoid putting their own perspectives into or onto the, the, the respondents and the people who are talking about. And so, finding high quality personnel and spending the time and effort to develop procedures to train them, to evaluate performance, to monitor data, and to dismiss, I'm sorry to say this, but and to dismiss staff um, who are not adequate. They may be very adequate in doing uh, survey research but they're just not adequate for the kind of work um, that you need to engage in. And so all of those pieces have to be negotiated, have to be set up ahead of time. Two slides of uh, some black specific issues. The focus on adolescence. I'm just going to highlight some sort of sticky problems here. What about boys? What's the justification for leaving them out? Is that all right? I'm not passing judgment here. I'm just raising issues. What's the justification for leaving them out? Do you have How can we generalize from one type of beneficiary, adolescent girls, to other types of beneficiaries that brought to their services to? How do we reach out of school girls? And one last set of issues around BRAC, the shifting strategic plan in BRAC has turned out to be a major challenge uh, to ensure and, and forcing us to reconsider the applicability, the applicability for the change in uh, BRAC strategy of what we initially set out to do. And finally, one more little note, discrepancies between formal documents and field uh, observations. We will do a program impact pathway. The descriptions derived from documents do not match field observations. What do you do with that? How should we deal with these in planning next steps and making reservations, recommendations? These are just some of the issues that I think emerge out of, from the discussions we've had. And at that, I'm going to be quiet and invite all of you to. Um, share your views, your perspectives, your questions, your statements, and so on. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I want to remain here, but I don't have a mic. Please uh, raise your hands. Where are the mic? Uh, the microphones are there. And uh, please identify yourself. Uh, your name and your organization and the question, and then please mention to whom that question is referred. Um, we have 25 minutes, so I will please ask you to be brief in your questions or the most succinct you can. Hi, I'm Robert Acatia from the International Data Center. Um, quick question uh, Can you give us an example of um, a 
scenario where you failed? Uh, in terms of all having done all this background research and looking at the processes, can you give us an example of where you failed and why? Um, and what did you do to that? But my second question is related to sustainability. So you do all this work as BRAC or whichever NGO you are within a very complex uh, skill set, right? You have the skill set, your organization is, is, is uh, has the right, the right number of people to do that and the skill set to do that. When you transition on and you move out of an area and that activity is owned by the government or say another institution that doesn't have that skill set, how do you ensure that they understand some of these fundamental issues in driving their own country agenda forward? So if you could explain that. Uh, let's take a few questions and, and then we can respond. Ed from the University of South Carolina. I have a, a question for Jane. So as I heard what you presented, it seemed to me that it pretty much primarily fell into the cognitive domain about what did the girls think. And I'm curious if you were able to explore with them the affective or emotional domain because that's likely to be a primary driver of what they do. So if so, what did you learn? Thank you. I heard there was another question. Yeah. And then we come to it. Hi, um, firstly thanks for that um, wonderful panel. Um, really a highlight for me so far in the conference. Um, really interesting. I'm Therese Swinnen from ENN and working on a project to support knowledge management services to the Scaliac Nutrition Movement. Um, so this has been incredibly relevant to the SUN project and what SUN governments are trying to do. Um, just a couple of questions. The first one is on geographic convergence. And Panini said, um, you know, the what's vital to integration is being able to converge programs on the same child. So my question is about sectors that are working with a different basic unit. How do you actually bring about convergence when you have, I think Jamie mentioned, you know, if you've got WASH working on a district level and you have health working targeting a household level, how do you bring that together um, in practice? Um, and secondly, I was very interested from what, about what Heather said about the Timor Lest example um, and what's happened there. So I'd be really interested to hear more about that and how you think that model might be applied in, in other countries. Um, because I think a lot of countries have joined the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement and are really grappling with all the issues that, that you've talked about today. And there's still a real absence of practical resources for taking that forward. Thanks. Let's respond to a round of questions and then we'll go to the next one. So who wants to take the... So one was directed to Jamie and then... I can, I can take a failure question. Ah, okay. So <laughs> at the failure, I think we can spread it among the panel. Um, it's not entirely... Um, I mean, my... Yes. Um, I, I think from, from the standpoint of the ethnographic work, um, that iterative structure assumes that some lines of questioning are going to fail. And you know, you do you go wide at the beginning and the whole art of it is just to figure out, you know, where to keep on going and when to give up after um, you know, throwing you know, good effort after bad. Uh, so I would say that um, you know we probably we may have failed in some big ways that uh, I can't actually come up with right now, but we do at least anticipate the likelihood. And for instance, in our you know we, we, we had ambitions about engaging the girls in in discussions about really um, what their hopes you know expectations were for their lives. We found that that line of questioning really went very quickly to, oh, I want to be a doctor, oh, I want to be um, a teacher. And it really wasn't a very rich conversation. Uh, now, with a different mix of skills in the research team, uh, we might have been able to you know, work our way around that and get something good. But we, um, we failed uh, to, to generate much from that, and so we put our eggs in other baskets. That's kind of what I would say uh, about that. Then, in terms of Ed's question about the, um, you know, the what we learn from the cognitive side, I would, I guess, I would first say that 
Um, yes, the, I think the missing piece that's often provided through the FES methodology is the cognitive piece. You know, you can uh, somehow obliquely or sort of indirectly sort of generate this um, idea of what people, how people conceptualize a particular problem. Um, uh, but I would say uh, that in our case, uh, again, partly because of the limitations, um, you know, um, in the field, we opted to um, connect, uh, you know, you have these models, you can structure things as you like, and we threw into the mix, um, as I mentioned, a lot of questions about particular messages and where they've been heard and uh, who told them. And so there was a kind of systematic attempt to map the kind of, the way that information was moving. And amongst those, you know, at the end of that process, um, we asked people then to talk about, you know, um, how easy or difficult it was to rank on a scale, uh, was it a five-point scale or was it a three-point scale, how difficult or easy they felt it was to, um, to actualize this health information. So, um, you know, it's still asking for opinions, but it is at least connecting those opinions with material constraints and issues. Um, so that's just kind of by way of, um, uh, I mean, I think you're right that, that the, the cargo piece is the, is the piece that, um, that this throws in that often isn't there. Um, then in terms of um, what we learn about, I think you're, if I understood your question, it was, you know, what did we learn about how girls felt? Um, we, you know, uh, we, we, we had some limitations in the, in the sort of uh, depth of kind of ethnographic interviewing we could do, although we were well backstopped on the, on the analysis of textual data and narrative data. Um, so we were able to generate some interesting uh, questions, uh, and I don't think we have the answers yet. So for instance, in the matter of snacks, you know, if you look at the narrative data, what we started to see was a pattern that whenever snacks came up, or at least frequently, they were connected with the father. Um, and so there, you mentioned, you know, the emotional side of things. You know, it's possible that there's some kind of axis of emotion, you know, between the father and the daughter that is captured in snacks, snacking, purchasing snacks for children, etc. We want to explore that further and, you know, and to see whether there's something there that might be um, good material for, you know, uh, behavior change scenarios. But we don't know for sure yet, but that's the kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, I will pass the, the word to the Heather. You have other questions? So, so I'll respond to two questions. One is a response to a failure story. Um, we have many failure stories, but we have one that we just finished work on, which is very fresh in my mind. Um, we've just finished a process evaluation of a program in India that brings women's group, women together in self-help groups with the idea that they will engage in savings and loan. And you know what, hey, these women are together in groups anyway and meeting every week. So let's try and layer some health and nutrition um, behavior chain. And let's also give them inputs on kitchen gardens. So we're really there trying to integrate the gender and agriculture and the health and nutrition behavior change. Um, our biggest lesson from the process evaluation work we've done is that if your platform is not good and is not solid, um, there is only so much you can do in terms of integrating and other sectors considerations into it. So what we find is that the people that facilitate the core aspect of the platform have so much going on just to get women to do their, in their weekly meetings, their savings and loan component of the work, um, that you know, they're not able to actually engage them fully on the health and nutrition behavior change side of things. We also found that the training on the health and nutrition behavior change content wasn't effective. And so even though these people knew they should do that, they actually didn't have accurate content knowledge on, you know, their nutrition knowledge was actually pretty shaky and scary, almost to the point where I'm like, I don't want them talking to anyone else about nutrition. <laughs> so, hey, I mean, we, we have the joy of discussing the results of this with uh, our counterparts. 
uh, next week, and I know it's going to be a hot conversation. <laughs> um, but to me, you know, we also have a, a very interesting example from Bangladesh where they're trying to integrate nutrition more into the health system. And this is work that we've done with Kuntal, who's in the audience, and with ICTRP. And there again, there are some fundamental problems with the platform. If you have only two minutes in a, in a sick child contact, uh, calling your IMCI uh, corner contact point, IMCI plus nutrition, uh, is not going to help because they're not even executing IMCI well. If they were doing IMCI, they would be doing nutrition. So relabeling the corner, uh, you know, and then the whole issue of what the curable platform can do or not do is, is also there. So I think there's some really interesting examples there. The question on geographic convergence, you know, really fantastic question. It's a very real issue. But what you find is that it is possible to open up and, and figure out how to converge your sectoral operation units. So we have some very nice examples from India, where you have two ministries that actually together deliver uh, nutrition-specific interventions. So even to get your full coverage of nutrition-specific, you need them to, uh, to actually work with the same geographic catchment areas. And the states in India that actually opened up catchment area boundaries and then reclosed them around the same catchment areas did really well. And so that's a key lesson over there. We also have an example now where in multiple ministries uh, that sort of line up to rural development, they've opened up the API boundaries on their monitoring data systems, which means that you can rejoin and recreate um, data boundaries through the API sort of process to then look at the same geographic unit, regardless of what their actual sectoral units of programming are. So I think there's some very, very innovative work going on. It's a very, very important conversation to have, especially with large scale government, with, with government action, especially with government action. This is not such a big issue for our NGO type integrated programs. Yeah. Heather. I'll try and answer two questions in one. Um, the question around government engagement and sustainability, and then just a little bit more about the Timor. Um, program. And I want to start by saying this is really complex. <laughs> um, you know, we came, we walked into this with lots of support and as I said, quite a few ingredients for success. And the multiplier effect of having different sectors, different levels, national, sub-national, community, NGO, government, and bringing that all together to get everybody happily working together is complex. And I think what we have learned is that to move people from that space of traditional programming, traditional thinking, and my sector, and this is what we've already, uh, this is what we do, to collaboration, which is more than just meeting together in a room and discussing and saying that's collaboration, more than just doing an activity on the ground and saying we collaborate. You actually do need some really um, simple tools to make that easy, to make it the norm. And I think this is where technology for our program is, is playing a neat role, but also that joint, the, the joint planning, the joint collaboration, the, the joint planning, the joint training. I mean, the video that we, I showed just now, we, it was partners that put that, that video together. And just that process was a really, really, really rich process of capacity building, where they're writing down the messages to the household. So I think it's but it's resource heavy and it's time consuming and I think we're going to be learning some really key lessons along along the way of what does make that collaboration and integration easy. Um, and but I can certainly say it's complex <laughs> at the moment but we're, we're, we're moving along that the spectrum. Okay. I'm going to put on a different hat for a moment. Thanks. Thank, thank you, all of you, for these really exciting comments. I'm going to put a different hat on. This symposium is sponsored partly by NI and partly by CISM, the Society for Implement Implementation Research and Nutrition. We in CISM are looking for ways to serve you, to become a repository for exchange, for information, for tools, etc. 
cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It occurs to me that one of the areas um, that we have not yet developed well in the system uh, discussion is the sharing of experiences from integrating um, programs that tend to integrate across platforms or across agencies. And the potential for establishing a working group that focuses specifically on this, that potential is absolutely there. All that it takes is for somebody to step up to write to us on the advisory, on the, uh, what are we? The board. The board. The board. On the board and say, we were, we're very interested in starting a working group to deal with this and we'll put some effort into it, and I can foresee some very exciting and helpful things coming out of it. So, number one, join the system if you haven't already, and secondly, consider some of you getting together and deciding that you're going to work in this space. I think, I think that it offers an enormous opportunity. Thank you so much. I call that part. Please, I have a question here. Um, then, I? I'm Sirimo Nair from uh, MS University, Gujarat. Uh, I have a comment to make to Dr. Bento. Uh, you said program impact pathways differs, and the situation differs from what is being in, in the document and in practice. We have few experiences to share which has come from uh, the borderline of Gujarat and Maharashtra, a very similar situation we are working with. And uh, uh, we had few experiences which were very clear, where we went and uh, moved into the groups with the self-help women groups. We could understand uh, the aspects of how they take up their daily lives and uh, how the nutrition was not being an impact in their daily lives. And therefore, we redesigned the program and uh, used some of their own components which were existing and used their own food systems to strengthen and slowly it is now in progress. This is almost a year back. That's one uh, thing. I had uh, uh, one question to Mr. Lee. Uh, that was, uh, you mentioned the sample sizes about 20, 27, the school going in. Uh, was it only a small area or was it just a uh, priority based assumption which you wanted to design and experiment with it. I mean the um, the the method. Yeah, the method. The method. So, the method. Just, 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 I have another question. Let me sure. have another question and then we'll respond. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the participants. It was a great uh, discussion. Thank you so much. We have one question there, and if you do your question in one minute, yes, you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Taylor. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. We, last night over dinner, were talking about how this panel was exactly what was missing from the conference. And there's a lot of incredible research that's happening, and we've heard it, and it's awesome. But the fact that you're talking about integration, and you're actually talking about implementation, is very appreciated, so thank you. Um, and to take that a step further, I think, you know, four years from now, if this similar panel comes back and talks about integration, or really talks about that gap between research and implementation, which has been touched on a lot, I think that would be awesome for the conference. Um, so my question is for Dr. Heather Grieve, and it talks about, it's about the ICT component. And so I have to start in saying, I'm a huge fan of integration, I really believe in ICT. However, I remember being in grad school, and I give you a, like a question, what is public health? Write one page with a team of six people. And they make you go through this process where you do all of this research and you come back and say, public health is everything. So I question this sort of sticker that you have in all of these houses, and I'm not sure if I totally understood correctly, but it seemed to me that you were asking participants to record every type of public health sort of activity within this sort of sticker process, and I'm just wondering, has integration gone too far? Ah. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think it's, um, Thank you so much. And just a follow up, what's the sustainability piece for something that would be so intensive? Last question, okay, there. It's, it's really less of a question and more just of a, of a, of a 
of an observation I did that I really want to emphasize for this particular group, <clears throat> and I promise to do it in a minute. <laughs> um, it's that it basically relates to what Pranima and the experience, the practical experience from Timor Leste is that, that what Pranima was talking about that we did was based on in-depth case studies from Colombia and from Senegal, where we looked at how this process of multi-sectoral programming actually took place. And I just want to emphasize that what we really found and there's a publication about that that does the frameworks and does the lessons. What is really reflected in the experience that you're talking about from Timor Leste is that it's really about an approach than a model. And it sort of annoyed me when the bank, when the World Bank came out later with the publication that said, think multi-sectorally but work sectorally, which to me just completely defeated the purpose of, number one, we don't achieve much more if we just work sectorally. And there are, and I think it was really, it was basically sort of a, accommodating a defeatism that we can't work across sectors, when I think the proof is at, on the ground that if you take an approach where you get participation and you have co-learning and co-experiencing and co-participation, you can achieve that. And I think that's the lesson that I think that I want to, to sort of make and leave people with, is that it takes time. But, but the kinds of experiences they had in Colombia the person who was the managing director said, first, I take care of my partners. They're my babies. And the second, so that we, so that we understand why we're doing it and it's a benefit to everybody. And the second thing is that, that, when we, that when we work together, that we all understand what we're all doing uh, as well. So I think that those kinds of things are the most important thing. It's an approach rather than a model. Thank you so much. Um, you have one minute, please. And Heather, you have one minute because we're going to make time. Right. Or you want to take it later and respond it later? We can do that. Yeah. Yeah. I actually I'm, I'll just clarify on the sticker. Um, so it's not integration gone too far, but it, yeah. The sticker is is used as a household identifier. So when a when a Community, when a household signs up to be a Hamatok household, it is the way of identi oh, sorry, identifying that household. And when a partner from any of the different sectors visits that household, they're able to use that opportunity by scanning the sticker and on a QR code, and information about that household will come up. If information about who the last um, partner was that came there, how many visits they had, what messages they've been given, what data might be still missing, what messages that they, that, that household may or may not have received. So an example might be that the Ministry of Health is there a month ago, and these are really remote households, so households that you're not seeing every week, right? we're talking about months that it might be between partner visits that uh, the Ministry of Health might have been there a month ago and provided some information to the household on exclusive breastfeeding because there was a new baby there. That information, when the next partner comes along, it might be somebody from the water aid that's doing some work around water and sanitation and all. They will scan that code and the information about what was provided to that household a month ago from the Ministry of Health is there and it will be an opportunity then for that the, the water age that water people to reinforce the message around exclusive breastfeeding or show a video that they might have seen or check that, that um, certain things are in place or not. So it's just a way of reinforcing targeted messages and making sure that every opportunity with that household counts. So it's, yeah. And, and one of the other things that we're really doing is, is pulling out each of these behaviours that we want to impact um, and doing some really rigorous formative research around each of these behaviours and looking at what are the drivers, what are the triggers, what, what motivates people to, to do a certain behaviour or not do a certain behaviour. So the messaging will be quite targeted to, 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 the, to the, the actual community. Thank you so much. I think we talked about the number of contact points, I guess, at that time. It's not our integration, it's the number of contact points from the Yes, So, uh, we are ready for lunch. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you for the panelists. I think it was a wonderful uh, panel. A lot of uh, thoughts after this. Uh, again, uh, please join the Society of Implementation Science of Nutrition. Uh, in the next 15 days or so, it's still free. So <laughs> you can do it because after that, uh, it's, it's not going to be possible. 
but please join the, we are looking forward to hearing from you for your experiences, to having you working in groups as, as Greta mentioned. Uh, and reach out to uh, our panelists if you have any other questions. Uh, I would really just like to close saying that it's worth investing in, in implementation. Organizations, some organizations uh, do that in implementation research. It's a means to improve the likelihood of success. Uh, it's also a good opportunity to learn. And, and, you know, <coughs> yes, what we have been good at is in terms of the forecasting the resources that are needed and the time that is needed. So I, I think that the more we learn, we will be able to be more accurate on that and convince more organizations to join in this. And thank you.